has the 19th Sri Hari Krishna Shastri Memorial Award Lecture. This series of lecture was initiated in 2000 to pay homage to the late Sri Hari Krishna Shastri Ji, who has contributed immensely in improving the service condition of agricultural scientists in this country. The purpose of instituting this annual award is to motivate the agricultural scientists and the award carries a cash price of 25,000 and a citation. Now I may take the proud privilege of inviting the dignitaries onto the dais. The chairman of the function, Dr. Akhilesh Tiyabi, <coughs> Professor and J.C. Bose National Fellow, Department of Plant Molecular Biology, <laughs> University of Delhi. So kindly grace the dais. Yeah. Being a biochemist myself, it's at most pride to invite the 19th Sri Hari Krishna Shastri Memorial Awardee. The eminent speaker, Dr. Shelly Praveen, Head Division of Biochemistry, IERA. Dr. A.K. Singh, Director and Vice Chancellor of IERA, and Dr. Rashmi, Dean and Joint Representation of IERA. Kindly join the dignitaries on the dais. May the darkness swept away by the wisdom of light. So may I now request the dignitaries on the dais to lighten the auspicious ceremonial lamp and to pay the floral tribute. Director IRA to welcome Dr. Shelly Praveen, 
who is a body of this prestigious award. I would like to apprise the audience about this particular award. Shri Hari Krishna Shastri Memorial Award was initiated in the year 2000-2001 on the request of Shri Mati Viva Shastri Ji, wife of late Shri Hari Krishna Shastri Ji. Shri Shastri Ji is MOS for Agriculture. He was MOS Agriculture and has contributed a lot in improving the service conditions of the agricultural scientists at the time when it was needed most which proved to be the great source of encouragement for improving the quality of agricultural research, education, and extension. The purpose of instituting this annual award was to motivate agricultural scientists by recognizing their contributions to agricultural research, education, and extension in our country. The award carries a cash prize of 25,000 and citation, as mentioned earlier. So, Without wasting much time, now I would request, request uh, Dr. A.K. Singh, Director IRI, to introduce the chairperson to the audience. Thank you. Dr. Akhilesh Kumar Tyagi, Professor and J.C. Bose Mission Fellow. Department of Land Molecular Biology, University of Delhi. And on the dais, Dr. Saini Praveen, winner of this prestigious award. And Dean, Dr. Agrawal, Dr. Pintel, Dr. Anupam Barma, and many of our senior colleagues, joint directors, faculty members, and dear students. And Dr. Khalesh Kumar, Tyagi has been working in the area of plant genomics and biotechnology. He successfully led first successful Indian initiative on genome-wide sequencing in rice, tomato and desi chickpea. This has heralded the era of high throughput genomics in India. Pioneering contributions were made to the area of new and sub-functionalization of regulatory gene families in plants during evolution. A transcriptome atlas of water deficit response and grain development in rice has been generated. Novel gene alleles were categorized with a view to gain and protect yield. Overall, 250 publications of international repute have been generated with GSH index of 60 and 15,000 citations. This research is largely an outcome of investigations of national and international collaborators and 120 postdoctoral, doctoral, master fellow, and trainee researchers carried out under the auspices of several projects executed in his leadership. He is serving on editorial boards of transgenic research, molecular genetics, genomics, rice, and others. At the University of Delhi, Prof. Tabi has served as head, Department of Plant Molecular Biology, Chairman Board of Interdisciplinary and Applied Sciences and Director Interdisciplinary Center for Plant Genomics. Professor Tyagi has also provided leadership to the National Institute of Plant Genome Research as Director and to National Agri-Food Biotechnology Institute as Executive Director. In his leadership as President, the National Academy of Sciences India and its chapter reached about 20,000 people, including children, women, and those from rural areas under its science and society program during 15 and 16. He served as chairman of DBT UGC task force on human resource development, program advisory committee on plant sciences, DST, Government of India, and on governing boards of more than 10 institutions. He is serving as chairman of DBT task force on Star College scheme and president Indian Society of plant physiology. He is a recipient of many prestigious awards and recognitions like J.C. Bose National Fellowship Award, National Bioscience Award, G.M. Modi Award for Innovative Science and Technology, Basin Award for Science and Technology, Birbal Sarni Medal of IPS, B.P. Paul Memorial Award of ISCA, among others. 
He is fellow of the National Academy of Sciences India, the National Science Academy, the Indian Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, and the World Academy of Sciences. So uh, there are many laurels attached to you, and uh, time may not allow me to read all those achievements made by you. And when many names were being discussed for chairing this session, obviously, all those who were concerned, they recommended your name to be, uh, to be the chair for this session. And I hope that with your expert remarks, definitely the students and the teachers also will be benefited largely to take their research programs in that direction. Thank you very much for accepting our offer. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now request the chairman of the session to kindly introduce the eminent speaker to this house. Using the latest tools of proteomics and gene silencing editing 
in heat stress management, in developing virus resistance, and in nutritional enhancement. Based on secondary metabolites, starch and lipid management in soybean, rice, and pearl Her teaching efforts contribute to developing trained human resources involved in scientific interventions in different national and international laboratories. I think the institution has done a justice to award her Sri Hari Krishna Shastri Memorial Award Lecture and we look forward for your lecture, a stimulating lecture uh, because I know that you have done wonderful work, Dr. Shari. Respected Chairman Sir, Dr. Akhilesh Tiyagi, Director IRI, Dr. A.K. Singh, Dean and Joint Director Education, Dr. Rashmi Agarwal, and my colleague from Division of Plant Pathology, Professor Anupam Varma, Dr. Jain, former Dean, and my collaborator in many of my research works, Dr. Deepak Painter, the coordinator of Transgenic Research network project under which I did a lot of work which I am going to present today. Dr. J.P. Sharma, Joint Director Extension, my colleagues from Division of Plant Pathology and Biochemistry, all the heads of the division present here and professors, faculty members of IRI and students. With great respect and humility, I am standing before you to deliver this 19th Shri Hari Krishna Shastri Memorial Award. As it is mentioned that he was a great advocate of agriculture research, so it is really an honor for me to stand before you. Before I start my lecture, I want to submit here that this podium, from this podium I defended my IRI PhD thesis, and from that time to this time, this is all possible because of the guidance and training by my teachers. Some of them are present in the audience. Operation by my colleagues and the good work done by the students. So with this note, I want to present my work under the title, Patterns and Rhythms of Biochemical Changes During Stress and Understanding for Management. I am a biochemist unless we understand that what biochemical changes are happening in the system, it is difficult to manage. So I am trying to summarize some of my work by which we can understand the key points where we can develop management strategies. To introduce my topic, it is important to understand that in all living organi organisms, the biochemical reactions are taking place all the time. And the key point of the, these reactions is a cell, center point is a cell. And in the cell there is a production of energy in the form of ATP and it is a consumption also in the form of ATP is giving energy. So there is a perfect balance in the cell that energy is generated and energy is consumed. But whenever the cells are in stress, there is an impairment between the energy produced and the energy consumed. And because of that reason, there are certain free radicals are formed, which we say that reactive oxygen species, and it is a very common phenomenon in any of the stress that ROS are formed. And if you see these ROS, they are nothing but, a, as they are free radicals, they are highly <coughs> reactive. Once they are very reactive, they are damaging the cell membrane and that is the damage done to the cell and this is where we have to cope up the host to, damage, to face that damage. So if you see that host cells are also 
equipped with the very good antioxidant system and this oxidation process and the antioxidation process both go hand in hand. So why I have chosen the word changing patterns? So whenever there is a stress in the plant cell, some of the metabolic pathways are disturbed and because of that, some of the patterns which we call them symptoms appear on the plant like curling of the leaf, ring spot on the fruit, this kind of a pattern in the tomatoes and some wilting symptoms in wheat. So these are the patterns and this is because of the post fitness is straight off. And this is not only happening in plant, if you see this kind of a damage is there and there is an imbalance between the reacting oxygen oxygen species which are created and the antioxidation system, if this imbalance is there even within us, there are several symptoms of stress which we have to cope up by making our antioxidant system very strong. So with this introduction, I am going to talk about what are the biochemical changes which are occurring. Basically, I am going to touch upon biotic and abiotic. My more focus is because I spent almost 23 years in management of viral diseases. So most of my talk is on viral infections. And last three years, I am also working on abiotic stress where I am going to talk about certain work on terminal heat in wheat and then strategies by which the host fight back or made to fight back. So these two topics I am going to cover. Coming to the first one, the biotic stresses, where the host and virus coexist. So management of virus is a tricky thing. Why? Because the virus coexist in the host and there is no white site available. You can spray and kill the virus because once you are spraying it, you are killing the whole host also. So under that condition, we have to manage the virus once it is surviving within the host. So there are several mechanisms. Host is equipped with the defense mechanism, whereas viral proteins are also very smart and they infringe the cellular metabolism. So I'm going to talk about by giving three different examples on which I work. And then based on these understanding, what are the strategies we developed by which the plant can fight back or make the plant fight back these viral infections. So if you see this triangle, in this triangle, whenever there is a virus start propagating in the host, what happens immediately the host sense that there is some invasion and there is an activation of plant defense mechanism. But at the same time, viral proteins are also very active and they want to infringe between these host defense mechanisms. So there is a constant battle between the two. Whosoever is winning, if the defense is strong, we are developing resistance. If the defense is weak and viral proteins are able to propagate, there is infection. So there is a host fitness trade-off and we are able to see symptoms with time. So this is how the virus invade. To understand what is happening whenever there is an infection, that if we say that we all are prone to viral infections and we all are having a well-defined immune responses. So although in our, uh, in human beings, immune responses are there, but still we are having some problem with the cell death, which is because of the imbalances between the ROS and the antioxidation system. Uh, Whereas in the plant system, there is not well-defined immune responses, but there are very well characterized defense mechanisms. So if you can see here, whenever <coughs> the virus invades, there is a tendency which we call as hypersensitive response. The cells die because of the chlorosis first followed by necrosis. So this kind of a pattern is basically when the healthy cells sacrifice themselves to prevent the spread of the virus to the neighboring cell. So this mechanism is going on. When this is happening, there are certain other biochemical changes occurring in the cell, which gives the message to the neighboring cells, tissues, and in the neighboring leaves that there is some invasion, and that will help in activating the defense at the systemic site. So this is all happening. And whenever there is a stimuli, stress stimuli, the necrosis takes place in most of the human cell, we say apoptosis, 
and finally it is a cell death. So why I am putting this picture here? Whenever we are experiencing any changes in the biochemistry of the host, this is basically governed, we all know, is by central dogma. So the DNA, once it's replicated, it's by transcription gives RNA, which we call as earlier only a messenger between a DNA and a protein. But now we know with a better understanding of a phenomena called RNA interference that it is an important step which can also regulate gene expression. And this RNA ultimately gives this protein, translated to protein. So this is all the three steps most want to be alerted whenever there are some infections. And up in these proteins also, the protein folding, proteins are enzymes, they are storage proteins. So whenever there is a change in the sequence of these proteins, their conformation also changes. And because of the change in conformation, they adapt to different environments. So I'm going to touch about the all the three aspects of central dogma by giving certain examples. So coming to the first example where the viral proteins infringe cellular metabolism, the viral proteins, they are affecting the central dogma at various stages. So if I come again to the same slide where DNA is affected, there is a mechanism called epigenetic regulation where the DNA gets methylated to stop replication as well as transcription. So the first point where the cell wants to be active, if there is some invasion or in, uh, alien DNA is appearing in the nucleus, the host cells wants to prevent the replication and the transcription by putting epigenetic machinery in place. Once that is, uh, if the viral DNA escapes that process, then the second step is at RNA. As I told you that RNA interference is an important defense mechanism by which the plants are equipped with, then this is the second point where the alien transcripts become double standard with the help of some enzymes called dicer and this machinery is, gets activated and it is cleaving those transcripts into small pieces so that they can prevent translation. Even if the alien RNA is escaping this route, then there is a third route which we call as proteosomal complex, where the role of the proteosomal complex is to make the turnover of the cell. Basically, this proteosomal complex is responsible for cleaving the unnecessary or the used protein by making the protein chain with the ubiquitin and they goes to this proteosomal complex, there are several subunits. So if the alien proteins are present in the cell, the, this gets activated and the proteins are to be chewed up. So right from DNA up to protein, there are several ways by which the plant cells try to put the defense. But at all the stages, the viral proteins also put their full efforts to escape these mechanisms. So I am taking three different examples on which I work. The first one is on tomato, tomato leaf curl virus. So this is a host and the host virus system on which work I work. Tomato leaf curl virus is a DNA virus. So there is a possibility that this mechanism where the DNA of the virus gets methylated should be operating in the defense mechanism. And the other, if that escape here, the viral transcript can be chewed up by the RNA interference. So we started working on this. Before I go into the detail of the experiment, I just want to introduce about this virus. As I told you, this is a single standard DNA virus and very small genome is there, which is about 2.7 kb. And the symptoms are yellow leaf curling or leaf curling. So different type of viruses are causing these symptoms. Sometimes they have only one genome subset, sometimes they are having two. So accordingly they are called as monopartite when they carry only one single standard DNA. If they are having two, they are called as bipartite. They are having only seven to eight ORFs which codes for protein. So it is a very small genome which codes only for a smaller protein. And you can very well see in the genome that they are all overlapping. And some of the genes are embedded within one another gene. 
So we took this gene which is called as a protein AC4 protein. Why we have chosen this AC4 protein? Because this is from long time it is known as a pathogenicity vector. So if a particular sequence of AC4 protein is there, the symptoms are very vigorous. But that time we were not knowing what actually AC4 is doing to make the symptom more vigorous. So with this, this is just a small protein of 100 amino acid. So you can imagine that a small 100 amino acid protein can is capable of infringing the host defense at multiple levels. So to start our experiment, what we wanted to know, whenever there is infection or we infiltrate, where exactly this protein is going into the cell. When we label this protein with the green fluorescent protein and so under the microscope we found that this protein is scattered in the cytoplasm. When we reached towards the nucleus we found that it is not going into the nucleus but it starts aggregating around the nucleus. So that is the first observation that why it is aggregating in the, around the nucleus and what is the possible role it is doing in the cytoplasm. With this basic information, we started to look at various options. Since it is aggregating along, uh, around the nucleus, we wanted to know that it may be preventing certain machinery from the cytoplasm to go inside the nucleus. That is what with that objective we started. And as we know that epigenetic mechanism, I told you that DNA gets mediated. This is in a, with the help of a protein called Argonaut 4 protein, which is present in the cytoplasm. And in a RNA dependent DNA methylation, whenever there is an alien DNA, which gives you transcription, this transcription, when it is converted to double stranded RNA and small interfering RNAs are formed, these small interfering RNAs sit on this argonaut 4 protein, they go back to the nucleus and with the help of a complex, they start methylating the alien DNA in a sequence specific manner to stop the replication of the virus and to stop the transcription of the virus and DNA. So viral protein don't want this process and that is how we found that this viral protein AC4 bound with the ego 4 argonaut 4 protein and prevent this protein to go inside. When it is doing this job, what happened that this machinery is hampered and this machinery is hampered not only for the viral DNA but for the maintenance of host gene expression also and that is how the host gene expression also gets disturbed and AC4 expression alone can give the virus-like symptoms. So from this, we are able to at least figure out when there is no virus inoculation and only AC4 protein is expressed, why we are getting viral-like symptoms because the host gene expression also gets affected when AC4 bound to the argonaut 4 protein. The another uh, option we wanted to explore, what exactly this protein is doing in the cytoplasm. <laughs> So again, as I mentioned in cytoplasm, the role of this RNAIE mechanism is to destroy the alien transcripts. So that is what we wanted to look at, whether AC4 is having some RNAIE suppression activity or not. To prove this concept, we developed two different type of experiments. I am not going into the detail of the experiment, but the introductory part I can say that we develop transgenic when AC4 protein is in abundance or constitutively expressed. So you can see here when AC4 transgenic are giving you virus-like symptoms. And another transgenic where we have used RNAIE constructs to silence this AC4. So broadly, in broad sense, this is here the AC4 is in abundance and this plant is capable of silencing AC4. When we inoculated these two type of plant with the virus, what we observed that in this kind of a setup, when AC4 is in abundance, methylation levels are very low because that is the one reason we found that AC4 bound with AC ego 4 and inhibit the methylation process and that is reflected here. 
Whereas whenever we are silencing AC4, this is not there. And if the methylation is prevented, if the methylation is less, virus accumulation is more. So the purpose of this small protein is to stop methylation of viral DNA so that virus can happily replicate and transcribe. So this is the one job we have assigned to AC4 by this experiment. Now at the RNA level, we wanted to prove whether it is having some RNAi suppression activity or not. There is, a, there is a essay by which this can be easily proved. Whenever an alien transcript which gives you an alien protein in the cell, there is a tendency of the cell to suppress the expression. So here I am taking the example of green fluorescent protein. So you can see the two halves of the leaf. If one of the half of the leaf, only the GFP protein you are infiltrating. So if GFP protein alone is going, there is an inbuilt mechanism of the host, the expression is produced. But if you infiltrate this construct along with the RNAi suppressor from the virus, the expression you can see, there is a difference in the expression on two sides of the leaf. So this is called as a grow infiltration patch assay, by which we can easily decide whether the viral protein is acting as a RNA suppressor or not. So for, by this method, we prove that AC4, these are the different, this is a uh, standard of control and these are four different mutant which we have developed for AC4 to know which part of the AC4 is responsible for this suppression activity. So we concluded this research by just saying that uh, AC4, a small 100 amino acid protein is localized around nuclear and in cytoplasm. It has a role both in transcriptional gene silencing as well as in post-transcriptional gene silencing. Coming to another example, which is papaya, papaya ring spot virus. In this, this is an RNA virus. So our focus was not at DNA. Our focus was to see what is happening at the RNA level or what is happening at the protein level. So for that purpose, when we studied, this is a uh, Introduction of this virus, this is a positive sense RNA as a genome, blister type of sequence appear on the leaf, under the EM it flexious particles can be seen and it is transmitted by uh, aphids. So this is a RNA virus, 10 different uh, ORFs are there and this RNA gives a polyprotein strategy by which this polyprotein is formed and this red color protein which is called as helper component protease. The job of this protease is to cleave these different uh, proteins from the polyprotein whenever they are required in the cell. So again we started with labeling this protein with the green fluorescent protein and wanted to know where exactly it is going. To our surprise we found that this protein is going to cytoplasm. It is going inside the nucleus also and it is present in the reti in endoplasmic reticle. <laughs> now it is very difficult to decide. Earlier we thought that because it is a RNA virus, so maybe there is no role of DNA control, but what it is doing in the nucleus. Still, this is a question mark. We cannot explain its role in the nucleus. Same is here. We are not able to explain what actually this protein is doing in the endoplasmic reticulum. But to further investigate, we wanted to again coming back to two systems, the system at the RNA level and the system at the protein level. As I told you, in the proteasome, there are several subunits and the job of this proteasome, it is not only a protease, sometimes the alien RNA can also be cleaved. So it is an active defense of the cell. So for that purpose, we wanted to know whether there is a, some role of proteasome in providing some defense to plant cell. For that purpose, what we did, we did the shutting of this complex or this machinery and we found if you temporarily shut by using an inhibitor called NG132, what happens? There is an aid and there is an accumulation of virus. So somehow if you can shut down the proteasomal mechanism, that will help the virus to propagate. 
it means something is some difference is there in the proteasome which is getting shut down so for that purpose we wanted to know how the virus protein is doing this job so instead of when this inhibitor we use the virus protein this hc pro we found that this protein is mimicking the function of this inhibitor it means if we are not using the inhibitor and we are just using the uh, viral protein it is also closing the uh, shutting down the proteasome so shutting down of the proteasome can be seen whenever the proteasome is shut the turnover of the protein is affected and there is a accumulation of protein which are to be cleaved and which have ubiquitin tail so this we have seen that proteasome is shut and when we have seen the virus accumulation both in terms of sim symptoms they are happily doing whenever the proteasome is shut and their accumulation increases so we we wanted to know that how the hc pro is capable of shutting this proteasome we tried this is 25 sub units and there are several sub unit which are having a role in a protease function where it cleaves the protein and there are sub sub units which can have a rna s function we tried several sub units and we zeroed down to these two sub units <coughs> which are crucial for the cleavage of the protein and by by uh, by molecular fluorescent complementation assay we found that hc pro viral protein binds with this protease protease component of proteasome and helping in the shutting of the proteasome so the purpose of this protein is to shut the proteasome because of the shutting there is a more virus accumulation and because of the shutting protein turnover is also affected which may be the manifestation of symptoms in the plant the another level we wanted to do is the rna level the same mechanism uh, the rna level different stages are there where different enzymes work and small interfering rnas are found we notice that in this process this hc pro protein is capable of binding with small interfering rna so that they cannot work on the viral transcript and hence acting as a rni suppressor so this protein works at the protein level as well as at the rna level so we conclude uh, this uh, study by giving uh, some emphasis that it is localized in nucleus cytoplasm and endoplasmic reticulum still these two things are question marks this hc pro is capable of binding with small rna so it is having a role in rna rna i suppression and it interacts with proteasomal component and inhibits its function so i uh, i want to acknowledge the role of dr thomas santo this is the work i have done under the indo spanish program funded by dst and on the con focal uh, scopy work i learned from dr thomas santo coming to the third system that is tomato groundnut bud necrosis virus uh, this is a very different virus as compared to all other plant viruses as the name indicate it is doing necrosis and it is the only virus which kills the plant most of the time the plant viruses survive in the host and they don't want to kill the plant because they have to live in there but this is the only virus this is called tospo virus which kills the plant and that is really a, a, a that is that time we really thought that what actually happens and what proteins are responsible which makes the plant kill so that is how again we come back to the same central dogma it is also an rna virus so we have not looked at the dna level we checked at the rna level and since it is doing cell death we wanted to know the signaling mechanism which is responsible for the cell death So in this again a brief introduction of this virus it is a tospo virus family butpunia viridi and if you see the symptom these necrotic symptoms are very very prevalent and within 8 to 15 days the plant dies once the virus infection is there and you are able to see sometimes the fruits in the market like this which is uh, this kind of a red spot and uh, this is under em it looks like this and it is transmitted by thrips if you see the genome there are three different genomes it go for and three different rnas are there uh, large medium and small so this is a very interesting story and i want to uh, share with you 
that we are maintaining this virus on a cowpea plant. And whenever we maintain, within four days we are able to see this kind of a chlorotic symptoms. And after eight days, these chlorotic symptoms become necrotic. And within eight to twelve days, these necrosis deepens and this leaf falls. So while this is happening on those leaves where we are inoculating the virus, at the same time we notice the leaves which we have not inoculated. These are systemic leaves, you know, upper leaves where we are not inoculated the virus. So within 15 days we have noticed that the upper leaves are showing this kind of a pattern. And within 24 days, the upper leaf dies because of the early senescence. So it is really interesting to find out why the inoculated leaf die because of necrosis and the upper leaf die because of the early senescence. So this is the experiment we wanted to study in detail and that is how we did several biochemical tests to understand what is the mechanism the cell is dying in a hypersensitive response and what is the mechanism which triggers the early senescence response in the systemic leaf. So we did several assays like uh, superoxide ion, different enzyme assay we did. We found that whatever is happening in the infection site, there is something different happening at the systemic site. So when we summarize our result in such a way that whenever there is a cell invasion at the inoculation site, there is an impairment between the energy production and the energy consumed. And ROS is formed to curb this ROS, several signal molecules are produced. They are different transcripts, they are different microRNAs, and these signal molecules move to the upper leaves. So actually the upper leaves we getting sensitized that there is a, a some infection process takes place, and because of that sensitization, there is a process which leads to early senescence. To figure out further, we wanted to know how exactly viral protein is doing this job. So again, we took one of the viral protein, which is a smaller protein present on the smaller RNA called NSS. When we labeled this protein and see under the confocal microscopy, we found this is the only protein till now reported it is going to the vacuoles. So it is really surprising what a viral protein is doing into the vacuoles. So as we all know, vacuoles are known for only two jobs. Their job is as a storage or their job is for the senescence. Whenever there is apoptosis, necrosis or the cell death, there are several vacuolar processing enzymes which are sitting in the vacuoles and they get activated and they trigger the cell death response. So we found whenever we infiltrate this viral protein, there is an initiation of different vacuolar processing enzyme. So that gives us the answer that this viral protein, which is targeted to vacuoles, is hitting the cell death and that is why this type of TOSCO cell is killing the plant and not the other type of cell. At the same time, the same protein is also working at the RNA level. So you can really appreciate the beauty of these viral protein. They are very small in structure, but they can affect the uh, plant defense at multiple steps. So besides doing this job to, for making the cell die, it is also working at the RNA level so that to protect the transcripts of the virus. So this is where we conclude like this that and uh, NSS is a RNA suppressor. It is localized both in vacuoles and in cytoplasm, and it is capable of affecting vacuolar processing enzymes. And I want to acknowledge the support by my colleague and uh, Dr. R. K. Chan, who has supported a lot of work in this TOSCO viral infection process. Coming to uh, after understanding these mechanisms, where exactly the viral proteins are. Uh, helping the virus to propagate. Now it is our turn to make the host critical in a sense that it can be well equipped with the defense pathway. So we develop different strategies by which the plant fight back or make to fight back. 
So coming to the first step, we all know several breeders are sitting here and for biotic stress management, we are using several R genes for the development of resistance. In tomato also, there are different R genes which are present. And these are labeled as TY1 to TY6. They are found on different chromosomes and they are going, they are used by various breeders to develop resistance. But still, as we all know, viruses with being a small uh, genome, they are capable of having recombinations and they are evolving. So various viral variants are developed and that is how we have very limited source of resistance available with us. It is very important to know what actually these genes are doing in the host which can prevent this, this is, uh, which can pre uh, prevent the virus propagation and help, help in the resistance development. Again, I am taking back you to the nucleus as well as in cytoplasm. If you see in the nucleus, I told you that methylation process is going on. So virus want to uh, virus want to protect virus DNA by methylation, but host want that this methylation machinery should be stronger. So maybe the these host resistance genes we did some assay to prove that these host resistance genes like TY2 may be an additional copy of Pol4 or Pol5 which are responsible for uh, making the plant epigenetic mechanism stronger so that the DNA can easily be methylated. Whereas the TY1 and 3G, they are nothing but the additional copy of RNA dependent RNA polymerase. The role of this protein is to make the double stranded RNA of the alien transcript. So whenever there is an invasion by the virus and the virus transcripts are formed, this enzyme work on it to make it double standard so that it can be chewed off. So these are the R genes which provide an additional copy of this enzyme which make the stronger system at the post transcriptional gene silencing as well as at the transcriptional gene silencing. To prove this concept, we did several assay in the sense that several uh, stag lines, different T by 1, 2 and 3, different lines we have <coughs> used in different combinations and when we inoculated the virus, bipartite virus as well as monopartite virus, we are able to find there is a difference in the methylation pattern of the viral genome where the T by 2 gene is present. So that is how a battle T by 2 gene helps in the making the methylation process more stronger whereas the AC4 protein from the virus side wants to make this process more difficult. So coming to that, that is the one way by which we can develop resistance. Now I am coming to the type of resistance which we can develop by using the viral derived sequences. As we know that these proteins are very important for virus and without these proteins, virus is not able to survive in the host so best thing is to silence these proteins. So with the transgenic strategy, in 2000, Dr. Deepak Painter has initiated a mega project under the banner of DBT. Then several crops were there. We initiated our work to use this viral derived resistance by using antisense and RNAi strategy. So we, that time we started with three viruses, and these two I discussed. This I am not able to handle because of the time limitation, but these three viruses we started with and different strategies like antisense RNA or the hairpin construct with different <coughs> length of the intron. We use several constructs and develop transgenic. At the same time, while doing this project, during the discussion it was found that why to develop transgenic only for one virus because in the field, and the tomato plant is prone to many viruses. So it is better to develop strategy together for the dual resistance. So for that purpose, we started for dual resistance where we developed the hairpin construct in such a way that we have chosen some sequences from this bud necrosis virus and some sequences from this tomato leaf bug virus. And we developed transgenic. Similarly, we developed transgenic with this, with another virus called Kumbo mosaic virus. And these transgenics were kept at Phytotron and later these are evaluated for their inheritance and 
evaluation for the tray that is virus resistance. We did the field trials also opposite to the phytotron we did field trials and that was really satisfying because whenever we are challenged inoculating in the pot experiment it was not exactly sometimes the true picture coming so that is how we went to the field trials and because of the limited field trials uh, some of the seed companies they saw our field trials and they were convinced that this kind of a transgenic approach can be used in their uh, system by which they can stack these genes with the other traits and to improve upon their uh, genotypes. For that purpose, uh, our transgenic and the constructs were licensed to two seed companies by IARI and Adventa India Limited, they stacked our genes with the other type of resistance which is native to the genotypes which is already available. They did this stacking whereas B2 Sheetal stacked our transgenic with the BT which is for the Helicoverpa armigerida. So with both the seed companies we worked closely under the BIRAC program. I am thankful to DBT BIRAC program uh, and uh, because that gives an opportunity to closely work with the private sector and uh, that was very uh, fruitful and we evaluated their stacked genotypes for the resistance developed by that. So this is the story which I want to convey based on my work on the biotech stress. Uh, last three years I am now in the division of biochemistry and uh, we initiated some work, already some good work is going on and we uh, wanted to address the problem of terminal heat stress in wheat. So there is uh, some different Rubisco activase enzyme which we studied and how to make this Rubisco activase enzyme thermostable. So just a brief background, whenever the carbon assimilation process takes place, this is taking place with the help of Rubisco enzyme. And Rubisco enzyme is mostly present in the inactive form and it gets activated by another enzyme or a chaperone protein, Rubisco activates. So this Rubisco activates, binds with the Rubisco and with the help of this activation, the carbon assimilation pathway triggers. But we are working on wheat and we notice that this Rubisco activates enzyme is a very, very heat sensitive enzyme. Whenever there is an increase in temperature, this enzyme chaperon protein gets inactivated and hence it affects this process and finally the grain yield is affected. So how to make this uh, small chaperon protein heat stable? For that purpose, we try to compare because there are certain C4 crops like maize which can tolerate and which can grow very well at higher temperatures like 40 plus temperatures. So under, when we compare the Rubisco activase enzyme, that is where I want to emphasize the role that how the protein adapts by changing the sequence. We found that there are sub several positions, 8 to 10 positions, where uh, there is a key change in amino acid when we saw comparison between the maize and the wheat. So we wanted to know whether these amino acid change at these key positions has some role in making this Rubisco activase more thermostable. For that purpose, several mutants were developed and they were expressed. And when their efficacy are checked at different temperatures, we found that some of the mutants are doing very well at the higher temperature. So in the previous session, like Dr. Pendle mentioned that genome editing or the mutagenesis is a good technique by which we can change particular amino acid in wheat to make that Rubisco activase more stable so that we can prevent that losses. So this is regarding the abiotic stress. Now the last two, three slides I want to dedicate to the oxidative stress which we all are experiencing. So it is going to be a little bit different what I talked just now. Uh, how to develop strategies by which we fight back or make to fight back oxidative stress, which we are experiencing every day. So, as I mentioned, when this balance is disturbed, our cells are like this, they are prone to damage by the free radicals. To prevent this damage, we should be ready with a lot of antioxidants. So, this
this antioxidants are coming nothing but from our diet. So if our diet is rich in antioxidants, uh, as in the earlier session, Dr. R. B. Singh mentioned about the fortification, role of fortification for malnutrition, it is important to, uh, to develop certain things for fortification and supplementation. We all know that if we, our diet is rich in antioxidants like carotenoids, anthocyanin, vitamin E, vitamin C, then we are able to fight back this stress more easily as compared to other people who are lowering these antioxidants. For that purpose, our diet should be rich in these pigments. So coming to the first pigment that is anthocyanin, they are very important aid during oxidative stress. We were working on this Manipur rice, black rice, which is called as chakhao. So this rice, when we analyzed, anthocyanin is present in many forms and their antioxidant potential also vary from one form to another. Then when we analyze the anthocyanin from this black rice, we found it is rich in cyanidine, which is really a very good form and capable of quenching free radicals. So for that purpose, we wanted to test what is the effect of this kind of anthocyanin in making uh, this uh, antioxidation process more vigorous. So we did some feeding assays that is with the help of the CSIR laboratory and this mouse feeding assay was done. This mouse is given a treatment for making it diabetic and when the rice powder from this uh, uh, black rice is uh, by oral gavaging is given to this mouse and after 35 days when the serum and the tissues were collected to see what is the pattern what we found, we have taken the control white rice, red rice and black rice, all the three rices we have taken and we see in the serum the blood glucose level is relatively less if we are using black rice. And we saw when we saw the tissues, pancreatic tissue, in type 2 diabetes when the pancreatic cells are in stress because they have to produce more insulin, there are certain lesions formed which is harmful. So whenever this kind of a diet is there, which is rich in a particular kind of anthocyanin, these lesions are relatively less. So with this assay, we cannot simply say that black rice can revert diabetes, but at least it will help in the management. If you look, the diet is rich of any pigment, which is rich in anthocyanin, and more precisely, the cyanidin. Coming to the second important factors which we call as vitamins or vital amines. You know that these are amines and they are very vital for our metabolism. Most of them they are the natural antioxidants and we use in our day to day life we are daily eating different vitamins maybe in the natural form as well as in the supplementation form. So I am using the word fortification and supplementation. I want to draw your attention here is that most of the oil you must have seen is fortified by vitamin E. And we say that vitamin E is an antioxidant and that is how it is preventing the rancidity of the oil. When I checked that what type of vitamin E is being used by different private companies to for the fortification purposes, I noticed that most of the vitamin E, not most, 100% of the vitamin E is synthetic in nature. And we are importing that synthetic vitamin E by giving a lot of money. If you see the chemistry of synthetic and the natural vitamin E, this is just a chemistry to <coughs> tell you that the chiral centers are there and there are different four molecules. They are optical isomers and in our body only one isomer is absorbed and the other isomer is not absorbed. We still we do not know what is the metabolism, so there are R forms and S forms. If you see in the synthetic uh, vitamin E, the, there are three chiral centers in vitamin E. So if you see the proportion, only 12.5% is triple R, which is absorbed by your body. Whereas if you extract vitamin E from the natural source, this is all triple R. So if the fortification is done by the natural vitamin E as compared to the synthetic, you will get better response. And all these forms which are present in your diet, we do not know. They strongly compete 
by the this ab uh, absorption of this form because structurally they are very similar to this form only they are different in the optical isomers so this is the story we i want to tell that why we need vitamin e from the natural source we started working on extracting vitamin e from different sources and since we want to be economically uh, important because if we are extracting from almond the cost will be more so it is not a wise idea but we check with different uh, uh, sources and we develop a strategy by which we can easily extract vitamin e purify and ready for uh, fortification so i will just give you economics of it uh, soya bean is a very important oil seed crop for us and we are extracting soya uh, this soya bean oil and after extraction the meal which we are exporting so this uh, the cost which i gathered is a dollar 310 for 1000 kg and this soya meal is having 9% of vitamin e retained in this so if a efficient protocol is available this 9% of vitamin e that is 90 kg can be extracted very well which is cost costing dollar 6750 so this is we are exporting and at that uh, same time we are importing this synthetic vitamin e for our fortification purpose so this is just a pilot experiment we did in our laboratory and we feel that this can be upscaled and it can go, go to the industry level where easily we can use this process to extract vitamin e coming to the last slide where i can tell you about the role of carotenoids so vitamin a is also very important for uh, both for the we know that it is good for the eyes right right from our schooling we know that if you eat more of vitamin a uh, your eyes will be good so carotenoids are present in many crops but uh, carrot is the most important source of carotenoids and beta carotene in carotenoids also different forms are there and uh, when we did the uh, extraction process from the carrot we found that uh, this is a upsc experiment by which the beta carotene concentration was found to be very good we have analyzed several varieties developed by pusa and we now coming to the point that which is the best variety by which we can extract maximum uh, vitamin a so this is another case of supplementation we can use this process for supplementing uh, food So now I am at the end of my talk, and uh, I want to acknowledge the work done by different people in different projects in the biotech stress, the virus management. I want to acknowledge the efforts by Ramesh, Anil, Satendra, Suneha, Priyanka, Vinuta, Nandita, Vikas, Gaurav, Energy. They are all PhD students. Three of the my postdoctoral fellows, Harpreet, Subbarbha, and Vipin, also contributed a lot. Uh, towards the development of transgenic and i want to give a tribute to this is this late uh, shri cm kushwa the technical officer who worked with me and he was very instrumental in doing all the field trials and because of his efforts in doing field trials we are able to convince the private sector about the efficacy of our transgenic so i want to greatly acknowledge his help regarding the abiotic stress the terminal heat work which i presented dr ajit ranjit kumar is here and he is actively participating in this work then antioxidant the three thing we i mentioned uh, vinutha is working on vitamin e veda krishnan is actively involved in anthocyanin and the work related to pd assay and shweta patel is working on vitamin a or carotenoids by which we have to strengthen our protocol further so that it can be upscaled at the industry level my thanks to various financial support given by various agency first of all dbt uh, first support which we got for the transgenic work dr deepak pentel i want to acknowledge your critical comments during those meetings and i learned a lot that in every meeting what are the shortfalls and the next meeting we are ready with various new results to convince you that we are working in this project and i want also want to acknowledge dr akhilesh tyagi most of the time in the sol program whenever i was there to defend my project under for tomato the critical comments and uh, 
and the suggestions were very helpful in modulating our project of objectives. I am thankful to DST because DST sponsored our Indo-Spanish program and because of that program I am able to learn the confocal microscopy and I am thankful to our former director Dr. H. S. Gupta who supported us to install that confocal microscope at Division of Plant Pathology. Dr. Patel is here. I want to acknowledge you, sir, that during your time, our transgenic were licensed to private company, and it is because of your efforts, it has reached to those, this, in that level. Again, uh, I am thinking positively, also Dr. Pintel mentioned that what is the negative negativity going on regarding the transgenic work, and still I am hopeful that the policy decision will be in favor of the scientists <coughs> and in the coming times our all transgenic work which is now stacking with us or with the private sector will see the light of the day. Now at the end my greatest gratitude to my mentor Professor <coughs> Anupam Varma. Thank you sir for holding my hand and guidance and inspiring my life. Thank you very much for your patient hearing and your presence in this hall. Thank you, ma'am, for mesmerizing us with the vibrant talk. So, my, may I now request uh, Dr. Priyanti for the Dear colleagues, uh, you all will agree that Dr. Shelly Parveen has presented a wonderful <coughs> talk, very wide in its spectrum, and uh, I was uh, sometimes getting lost, but then I recovered, and so I am telling you what uh, she was trying to say to us in summary. Essentially, she started with the idea of energy imbalance, which is reflected or is affected because of the biochemical changes and then went on to show the work on three viruses. The tomato leaf curd virus, is 4 protein, seems to work by interfering with r protein and also affecting the host transcriptional gene silence. The CX protein, which seems to be a protease, is probably an inhibitor of proteasome and also which ultimately respond by senescence, whereas those which are infected because of the ROS activity and location of this protein in vacuole show the necrosis. So there is a differential response shown by the plant. Then, while viruses try to do their job, plants are also not sitting silent. And therefore, there are genes in plant, particularly in tomato, she showed, that there are different R genes and these genes most interestingly <coughs> seem to be the ones which are involved in methylation process being possibly RNA fold 4 and RNA dependent RNA polymerase homoides. It would be wonderful if one could show these activities biochemically <coughs> because that will open up a new possibility <coughs> of uh, handling the virus resistance by manipulating these genes. Of course, her interesting work on transgenics against the virus is very important and has gone to the industry and we hope that this will see the light of the day in the hands of the farmer one day. Uh, I am quite a hopeful person despite everything which is going on that one day this will and we wish you good luck for that also. But she did not stop there. That's where the change came. She, I don't know if this is a change because you have moved from one division to another 
or it is because your interest, that is not clear to me, but certainly there is a change. And this is a visible change when you start to look at the least stress and uh, you are trying to handle in your own way or novel way Rubisco activates, which many people in the world are trying and they hope that uh, this terminal heat tolerance could be handled through some of this. There are other candidates also, but this is itself a very important molecule which people are targeting. Your work on oxidative stress in relation to black rice, uh, that's near to me, uh, is uh, on anthocyanin and cyanidins particularly is very important and so is the work related with vitamins in the human nutrition. Now, there is a word of wisdom and if, you, if I have any wisdom, and there is also a word of warning. And that is that uh, all these topics, friends, you will agree, could evolve into niche areas. There is no doubt about it. And in order to evolve these areas into niche, you need large groups. But I know that you are now head of the region, and therefore you can steer probably through all these projects together. But if not, then choose the one which you like most, where you hope to succeed and hypothesize most, and that would be the wonderful contribution that you will be able to make. From my side, I wish you all the best, and thank you for presenting your wonderful results to us, and congratulations. For you. Thank you so much. It's time to honor the distinguished chairperson of the session. So may I now request Dr. Indisi to the chair IARA to facilitate the chairman, Dr. Akhish Sadi, with a short and memento as a mark of our affection and respect.